Imagine, if you will, you're sitting down at your Hot Wheels custom PC, and you just logged out of AIM after typing G2G to the boys because your mom needs to use the phone. But you're bored, and sick of playing the kid picks or Hot Wheels stunt track driver included with the badass flames down the side of your PC. So you grab the newest game on the shelf and throw it in your buzzsaw of a CD-ROM drive and boot that biz up. The game starts and shows you a beautiful cinematic. An alien world is laid out before you. A little machine soon drops down your first egg. That's right, sucker, you're a parent now. What are you gonna do? Go out for some drinks with your friend Sam from the office? Hell no, you got an egg to worry about. You gotta stay home and be responsible. Watch that egg until it hatches. Out pops your blob of digital fur and eyes. It starts cooing and chittering and walking around and you think, whoa, this is beautiful. So you move your poltergeist hand over to the creature, and the icon changes to a hand reaching for what looks like a high five. And the newborn baby looks up all wide-eyed and trusting as you click, and slap that baby right across the ass with a hard smack! <coughs> the baby, rightfully terrified of a world where the first thing it sees slaps it, runs away, out into the wilderness. You give chase, hoping to make amends and swearing that you'll stop drinking with Sam and that you're so, so sorry. When you finally get the baby to stop, you try to apologize by wiggling some cheese you found on the floor at it, but the baby isn't convinced. You try playing some music on the radio, but the baby still sniffles and cowers. You move your hand closer, feeling pangs of guilt as the poor creature flinches at your approach, only to find that you can place your disembodied hand on the shivering baby's head and lovingly scratch behind its ears. The creature breathes out relief beginning to wash over it, as you start to understand that this little creature is your responsibility. Your whole world now. That you love this little baby. You gently move your floating hand into the creature's tiny paw, take hold of it and think, let's go home, little guy. Let's go home and eat some floor cheese. And then, attracted by all the hubbub, a hulking, toothy monster walks over and mercilessly rips the baby creature to shreds in front of you as you panic, holding tight until the last ounce of life drains from its helpless, naive eyes. <coughs> So, that was a lot. Parenthood, child abuse, and infanticide are a bit more than your average 10-year-old knows how to deal with, especially one who went into the experience blind, as I did. At any point, I could have dropped another egg from the egg machine, but as a kid, I decided to take a minute, both to try to emotionally process the roller coaster of life I had just stepped off of, and to read the fucking manual, because at zero points does this game stop to explain itself. The manual, on the other hand, explains quite a lot. But in case you've never had the sheer trauma of trying one of these supremely strange games, let me start out with some background. Way back in 1996, a game was released that was unlike any that came before, and most that came after it. That game was Creatures. You might be able to tell from the cute Tamagotchi Shmamagotchi tagline both how thoroughly entrenched in the 90s this game is and the main focus of gameplay. Creatures is a game first and foremost about caregiving. You as the player are not the hero, the villain, or even physically part of the game space, save for a disembodied floating hand that you use to interact with the world and its many inhabitants. In that sense, much of the game boils down to observing these inhabitants and the way that they interact with the world. Sure, you can shuffle around objects and explore on your own, but in effect the player is little more than a poltergeist. A very educational poltergeist most of the time. See, while you aren't really in the game world, you are responsible for holding the hands of these creatures from birth to death. Everything they see, eat, experience, or learn is determined by the way you treat them, most of the time. I say that because a lot of individual factors of creatures are initially set by the genes they were born with. Oh yes, they have entire genomes. More at 11. Back to the manual. The biggest selling point for many people was actually the underlying tech used to create the game, which differentiated artificial intelligence, which is what you're used to from most games, and artificial life, called a life from this point in history forward, wherein the creatures are shown not to be programmed with behaviors or characteristics by the developers, but instead through simulated biology. The games ran on an embedded scripting language called the Chaos Engine. No, not the, not the Yu-Gi-Oh thing. It's the underlying code that makes the games tick, and allowed for upgrading via injectable agents and functions. Now, I'm no computer scientist, but there are breakdowns of the technical aspects by people who actually know what they're talking about that I found fascinating. I'll link to that in the description. For now, though, just be aware that under the hood, Creatures featured a V8 Hemi far beyond its time that allowed the game to use early forms of neural networks to simulate biological processes for dozens of creatures at once, and each even had a genetic makeup that coded for its physical appearance, metabolism, preferences, and behavioral traits. That's not to say these things were perfect simulacrums of real biology, though. Seeing as this was ostensibly a video game and not the next step towards AGI, the genetics were limited to haploid organisms, with specific functions for each gene. This means they didn't have to deal with the kinds of things that complicate human genetics 
genetics, like dominance or junk genes. While the genomes that govern the beasties were simple relative to human genetics, they still underwent many of the same processes. Genomes controlled a set of traits or drives along with inhibiting or producing certain hormones based on the environment, and those individual genes could then be passed on to a subsequent generation. Or, and here's where it takes a particularly spicy turn, those genes could mutate randomly into the next generation. Small aside for those of you ahead of the class, yes. This does mean that the babysitting simulator can also be a eugenics simulator. No, I won't be going into that further. Essentially, this means that the people who coded the game didn't even know how anyone Norn would act in a given situation. Oh, right, these... these things? These are called Norns, and they're the abandoned pets of an ancient and incredibly advanced race of aliens. Buckle up, buckos, because we're about to do a segment I like to call Creatures Lore Explained. The creatures, as in the main creatures, though there are a few different kinds, are called Norns. The manual states that Norns are a friendly, curious social species, eager to learn and experience life to the fullest. They're also incredibly adorable, if a bit chatty. Norns were created by a technologically advanced progenitor race called the She, that's the She with two E's. Kind of like the firstborn from 2001, but far, far more ethically dubious. Take the Norns as an example. Why would they create such a pure and cuddly race of beings in the first place? The She created the race of Norns in order to serve them tea and biscuits. Yup. The She inhabit a circular world called Albia. Think Discworld with all the Terry Pratchett humor that comes with it. At least they used to until they dipped into space to find a more three-dimensional planet. When they dipped, though, they left everything, including all their floor cheese and incubators. That, unfortunately, is about all we get on them, since they aren't physically in any of the games, with a weird exception, and function mostly as a setup for the player finding working Norn-making machines on an abandoned Discworld. The Norns aren't the only creatures in town, though, as they often get harassed by the wandering Grendel. Not that Grendel. These Grendels. Let me quote from the manual again. Grendels live in the trees, with different genetic material. They are violent, steal food, and carry diseases. Oof. Well, the way 90s media hits different now is a topic for another essay, so I'm just gonna keep on trucking. There's also a third kind of creature, but they don't show up until the second game, so we'll steal that bridge when we come to it. Cracking open the manual, or any one of the fan-made survival guides, will provide you a brief rundown of how to care for your newborn Norn. The first thing to do whenever a baby Norn hatches is teach it to talk, since babies don't talk. How do you teach a baby to talk? Sit it down in front of the computer, of course, just like my parents did for me. Preferably with a snack and a juice box, while the computer cycles through pictures of all 20 verbs that exist in the world while repeating the names for each until the little Furby associates the action with the respective word. Once you have a close parental bond with your bundle of fur and they've learned the word for look, it's up to you to teach it about the rest of the objects in the world. Pick up that piece of floor cheese and repeatedly shout type FOOD into the console and they'll pretty quickly connect the two. You can even repeat this process without pointing at an object to get a creature to associate your name with the on-screen hand. From there, you're free to explore the world with your bright-eyed and bushy-tailed friend. As it ages, it'll grow through a number of stages of development going from baby to child to adolescent to adult before reaching the most British of senescent stages, pensioner. The creature will learn and grow and entertain itself, barring Oregon Trail levels of disease or Grendel attack, and once it's old enough, and provided an appropriate mate, and a slew of weirdly specific hormones, it's possible to create a natural egg. There is a whole lot to unpack here, including sex between these Neopets being called kiss popping. And I just don't want to get into it. With that, though, we've reached the closest thing to a score these games are going to get. Successful generations. You see, the overarching goal, in as much as there is one, isn't to hatch a Norn, raise it, and then watch it die alone. The main goal is to raise Norns that are clever and capable of surviving and breeding and teaching the next generation to survive in this harsh world. There are no endpoints, though, and you can continue this process forever, tweaking initial conditions and adjusting social and biological factors until you create a race of super Norns that need never fear the impurities of the Grendels. Oops. I seem to have stepped in a pile of eugenics again, that's, that's my bad. Let me just rinse that off and delve into something a little lighter. Okay, so not a whole lot lighter. 
but I absolutely could not talk about these games without mentioning the freedom afforded to the player, and how that created a faction within the player base who used the systems to be complete asshats. Other than abusing them via the direct method of continually smacking, a number of players made it their express goal to devise contraptions to more effectively and efficiently hurt these creatures. There were even websites created to show off the process and the effects it had, as well as sharing downloadable files of Norns that had been bred to be in constant pain, or injectable code for shock collars, or audio files of Norns being slapped to death. Now I went back and forth on whether or not to show these things, but fortunately, the only thing that remains are the archived websites with broken images and links, so I would be able to even if I wanted to, which I don't. The most well known of these was founded by someone who went by the screen name Anti Norn, and it was appropriately called Tortured Norns. Much in the way the community took two stances, one that played the game with the Norns' welfare at the forefront, and the other that took the opportunity to torture otherwise helpless digital beings, two distinct camps formed around Anti Norn. One side focused on rehabilitating the abused creatures, seeking to rehome them to a better environment and finding ways to undo the damage that torture inflicted. The other, sent death threats. These people's virtual vitriol was far more brutal than any injectable object in the game. Things so violent, I'm not comfortable sharing them here, but I'll post the interview with Antinorn where he talks about it in the description if you're curious. While we can all agree that torturing Norns is morally reprehensible, I hope we can also all agree that no human deserves to be threatened with violence. But wait, can we all agree that it's morally reprehensible to torture Norns? If so, why? After all, they aren't real beings, right? They're no more than bits of data being flipped in a cluster. In fact, one could argue that the game allows for such behavior on the part of the player, and that that is a tacit endorsement of such behavior. I disagree, though, and to help back that position up, I like to contrast creatures with another game I played while growing up. Interactive Buddy. Those of you who also grew up in the wild west of Adobe Flash Player are likely awash in memories, scrolling through new grounds to find games like this... and... Uh, others. Those of you who didn't, it's gone. Don't look for it, Flash is dead now, sorry about your luck. In case you aren't familiar though, allow me to briefly summarize. Interactive Buddy was a game about a little circle thing that lived in an empty gray void, and also featured an omnipotent floating hand. There were objects to toss into the void to get the buddy to interact with, and a fun time could be had by all. Except, this game did have a traditional scoring system. In order to unlock many of the objects included in the game, you had to pay the in-game currency, which you earned by torturing the fat Rayman in dozens of novel ways. I should mention that it's technically possible to earn cash by tickling or holding hands with the Rotund Fellow, but that method is abysmally slow compared to unleashing a fire hose on him. And look, he even likes it. The main difference between the two games is that one incentivizes digital torture, and the other is creatures. You can also see this in the respective design of the characters. The Norns have recognizable eyes and faces and broadcasted emotional states, in line with the Disney school of design that immediately gets you to identify with the characters. While the interactive buddy is six circles being held together by magnets, I guess, as well as being entirely immortal. Creatures, on the other hand, punishes the player by lack of punishment. Once a Norn dies, they're dead, and you are left alone to find a way to reconcile your own actions in order to sleep at night. Whew. I'm happy to be on the other side of that segment. How about you? While we're here, though, why don't we talk about how the game's changed over their releases? <laughs> In the second game, we find out pretty quickly that all the work we put into the first game was wasted, as Albia faced a cataclysmic volcanic eruption that destroyed most of the surface. However, this also unearthed the network of subterranean Xi infrastructure, which allowed what little life remained to utilize the still-functioning tech to come back even stronger. This entry also introduced a third creature to the mix. Etans. The Etans have a particular cheekiness and a fondness for technology, and will often be seen collecting scattered gizmos and gadgets for tinkering with. Luckily for our Norn friends, the Etans are also generally pacifist and often more amenable to sharing the world with other creatures. The graphics got a subtle boost in subsequent entries as well, though all three games look beautiful considering their age, and they could be enhanced further through custom code. By far the biggest difference between the first game and the following entries were the quality of life enhancements. The harrowing tale from the intro would have been easily avoided in the second game. Game, as the team added an indicator showing whether you're hovering over head scratch or ass smack territory before you click. Another thing added was a secondary computer terminal, so once your little gremlin learned verbs, you could teach it how to express basic needs as well. No longer forcing it to languish silently, it can tell you when it gets hungry or tired or lonely. The world was also huge relative to the first game, with a ton of areas to explore and ancient she labs to get back online. Initially, the screen is limited to following a selected Norn, and exploring by yourself is impossible. Once you raise a competent enough creature, though, it's 
it's possible to guide them over to the various technological power-ups and flip the switches. These power-ups allowed access to all kinds of crazy things like infinite scroll and hormone injectors and medical synthesis and even the gene splicer. Once this bad boy gets turned on, you can take any two creatures, Norn or not, and hybridize them, which opens up the floodgates to buffed up Grendel Norns and super intelligent Etten Norns and not at all eugenics again. The other main change in the second entry, outside of the mechanics, is tone. The first game gave very little lore to the player, and what it did give was tongue-in-cheek. Creatures 1 isn't about the plot, it's about the Norns you make along the way. The physical space the player can explore is sprawling, like I said before, and while the lore is still in short supply, the tidbits you do get feel more serious, less like a framing device for a babysitting simulator and more like a plausible world that can suck you in for hours. The third game in the mainline releases abandons Albia altogether, instead focusing on the She Ark, left abandoned in orbit around the round planet their race escaped to. The Ark, despite being abandoned after a Grendel invasion, of course maintained a full suite of eggs and ecosystems, along with all the fancy tech discovered in the previous game, allowing Norns and Grendels and Ettons to continue their eternal struggle for survival at the behest of a disembodied hand. The third game continues the trend started by the second, keeping the mechanical additions and lore expansions intact while also pushing the graphics even further. And honestly, if watching this has piqued your interest enough to try the series, I'd recommend starting here. Creatures 3 has by far the most refined formula in the series, taking all the lessons learned from earlier entries and putting its best foot forward with more intuitive controls. The GOG version, Creatures Exodus, even includes the docking station add-on. After the third game was released in 1999, a set of expansion packs were developed that flipped the script. Up until now, the story was a funny, if a bit flimsy, way of setting up the conceit for each game. The player, as Master Hand, starts in the otherwise abandoned world, soon to be filled with Norns. This new edition expanded the universe by adding the lone she to the canon. The lone she was antisocial, and, by the accounts of other she, mad obsessed with technology. While the rest of his race decided to ditch their space disc, the lone she worked deep underground in secret, tinkering with a project that would revolutionize not just the she, but the universe. You see, the lone she had discovered the warp. What is the warp? It's an unclear mass of blue energy, but I imagine it's a lot like jumping through the thing from sliders. It allowed the lone she to instantly leap across space and time, which he used to bounce around the multiverse, collecting odd bits of DNA and eggs for genetic engineering. Once he'd perfected the device, the lone she emerged from his laboratory to find that his people had f***ed off to space without him. Eager to show off his work, he grew a spaceship of his own, the Capilata, to follow his kind through the void. In order to launch his newly formed vessel, though, he needed a boost, which he got by causing the volcano in the middle of Albia to erupt erupt, rocketing his ship into space and dooming the entirety of the surface in the process. The Long Shi was unconcerned with this, and flew through space while continuing his experiments and discovering all sorts of Norns throughout the multiverse. Eventually, his ship was invaded by a type of Grendel the Shi had never seen before, a pair with the ability to teleport and a penchant for violence far beyond that of normal beasts. After subduing the pair with the help of his own Hardman Norns, he teleported the Grendels off the ship, but continued to wonder at how they'd arrived in the first place, and how they'd gained such strange abilities. Once the lone Shi had arrived at the Shi Ark, he made contact with the orbiting ship, only to see an unfamiliar face. A twisted Grendel-Shi hybrid answered his hailing call and said, We've been expecting you. The Banshee had eliminated his people and sent the Grendels aboard his ship as a message. They were in control now. Whoa! Left turn, right? The craziness of the story was nowhere to be found in-game or in the accompanying manuals, only being documented in an 11-part journal released to hype up the DLC. I found it to be one of the most compelling bits of storytelling in the entire series, though, so I had to talk about it here. But let's go back to the actual gameplay, which was where the series broke the mold, as it literally opened up whole new worlds to explore. While earlier entries in the series allowed custom code and downloadable genomes and sharing of norms, the docking station allowed players to connect up with other players, to see and transfer norms and to exchange ideas about how to build into the Ark, and to feel like they had a community surrounding their weird hobby. There were scores of fan websites that picked up the torch after the official servers went down, hosting official Norn breeds and custom objects, forums to discuss the games and share stories, and even a dedicated fanfiction repository. In fact, there is currently still a push to collect and collate all the breeds that can still be found into one place, and eventually bring back the community forum boards. Creatures is a series of games without a traditional scoring system, without a traditional fail state, without a traditional anything. It's not so much a game as an emotional exercise, as the reward for putting in the effort to understand the complex web of hidden mechanics and interactions is nothing more than a connection. The games show their age, to be sure. By modern standards, the UI is obtuse, the gameplay can be clunky, and the animations require a lot of active imagination to be immersive. 
It's a series of games that asks you to put in an immense amount of work, to learn an entire language of interactions to communicate with it, and it adds difficulties from the real world, like death that make the experience a lot of things with good only seldom being one of them. Why then would anyone in their right mind hit that button to start such a harrowing journey? It's so much easier to check out, to put the game back on the shelf, but if you did, they would be forever stuck in the same place, the same moment. Their story paused as bits of data in a cluster on your computer, until you work up the fortitude to see where their life goes or ends or worse. The data corrupts and their lives are lost forever. Maybe it seems silly to form an emotional connection with a chittering bundle of data. Sure, the creatures aren't real in the literal physical sense, but neither was Sherlock Holmes, or Mufasa, or Aerith. And they were very real in the emotional sense for a huge number of people when they died. Whether you're a child still struggling with the theory of mind, or an adult saddled with the burden of other people's thoughts, empathy is f***ing hard. It takes an immense amount of effort to connect to someone next to you, let alone a person across the world and behind a screen name. More and more though, that's what life asks us to do. I started out writing the story of a frustrating game I played as a kid in the hopes that it would be interesting to people who had never seen it before, and came to realize that the game was an emotional sandbox, a safe environment to tackle the hardest questions about myself, like how much work was I willing to put in to care about other living things? And I wasn't alone either. While traversing the digital ruins of web rings devoted to this game from another age, I saw the community that grew around these cute fluffy buggers. It was beautiful to see groups make amazing things and share them with each other, to write their own stories about the breeds they had made, and to dive deep into the code and create new worlds from whole cloth, to encourage one another to keep trying and keep doing the hard things in life, and to find the fun wherever possible. And I think that hits on the point of Creatures as a game, to me at least. That life is often difficult and filled with sadness, and then we die. So, in this nihilistic vacuum, it falls to those who still exist to continue clicking that start button, to keep trying, to help those around you, and to find stories that make life's trials interesting, and then to tell them, even if it feels like no one's listening. Which is exactly what Steve Grand has been doing this whole time! <laughs> Now I'd like to take a moment to give a disclaimer before launching into an exploration of fellow human Steve Grand, the designer of Creatures. It's important to keep in mind that I don't know this person personally, nor can I make any judgments of him. I can only describe what I've seen and read, which is the small slice of his life that has leaked into the public view, so please do not take anything I say as derogatory or derisive. Instead, take it as the view of an outsider looking in. Got all that? Good. The safety bars have come down, so please keep your arms, legs, and comments inside the ride at all times. Steve Grand is a weird dude. By weird, I mean the dictionary definition of weird. Supernatural. The man's a ghost. Look, let's check the Wikipedia page on him. No, not that guy, that's a musician. This page. Yeah, that's the whole page. Wait, what is this? Grandroids? I haven't seen that on any game shelf before. Is that, is that like a thing? So, as it happens, this is a new game that is actually in development. While the Kickstarter closed a while back, the video is still available to watch, and it is a doozy. I'll link the video in the description, pause here for you to go watch it. This is, this is me pausing for you to go watch it. Well? How was that? It's a lot to take in, I know, but it's also very illustrative. Not of Grandroids, of course, more of Steve as a person. As a human trying to make sense of this crazy thing we all have to make sense of. Life. There is a dev diary for the game that can still be accessed, one that gives a deep insight to the monumental task Steve signed himself up for. And it's a novel in and of itself. The day-to-day -day task of coding a regular game is extraordinarily difficult, and the task of coding an extraordinary game is almost Sisyphean, like one of the last entries I could find. I really wish I'd tried to get a research fellowship or something to do this. I'm still having so many new ideas and insights, and in a research context this would be fantastic. Each one a new paper. But as far as product development goes, I just need answers pronto, not whole new avenues to follow up. Then again, half the reason I'm sitting here on my own in America is because it was a fucking nightmare trying to get people in a traditional context to support my work. Way too ambitious and flaky for academia. Way too risky and, ironically, unambitious for business grants. Academia claims to want ambitious, high-risk ideas, but they don't really. They want people who can find grants to pay PhD students. If I gave this problem to PhD students, what would be the point of my 40 years of unique experience and intuition? I can't teach this stuff to people, it's too intuitive, so I'd just be the one writing grant proposals while the other people got no further with it. Having said that, this week's gone pretty well. 
I bring it up here not just for the fact that the development of Grandroids and the personal insight to be gleaned from the process of making it are interesting, though they surely are, but also because of the context that it couches creatures in. We live in an era of commodified art shipped directly to your desktop by AAA corporations, and in this era, it's easy to lose track of the amazing progress it took to get here. See, the first game was also a Sisyphean task, undertaken mostly by one man with a vision, and completed after 250,000 lines of code. He wrote the Chaos Engine from scratch. In this particular case, Case, a video game was both art and science, redefining what it's possible for a video game to be. Even after all that work, though, Steve described the game as having gone from saucepan to table because of all the features he'd hoped to add. It shows a dedication to exploration that I, for one, find inspiring, and I hope it gives you an inkling of just how much work went into a game about babysitting digital Ewoks. Before digging deep into this game again and finding its community, I had no idea the work it took to make Norns tick. And that's unfortunate. It's also why I felt I couldn't discuss the game without bringing up what Steve put into it. Creating life is something that we humans often take for granted. Some of us even do it by accident. The artificial life I've covered here, though, was no accident, and instead was the result of a remarkably structured chaos. He's also written two books, one that covers the creation of creatures and the philosophy behind it, and another that follows the development of Lucy, the baby orangutan droid, both of which are far more informative than I could hope to be in this video, and I'd recommend those if you'd like to dive deep into the philosophical end. I I, however, am far too broke to afford such nice things, so I decided to do the most reasonable thing I could think of and ask Steve Grand directly. He was incredibly receptive and answered the multitude of peculiar and oddly personal questions I had while writing this. The biggest burning question I had was whether he believed that there would ever be a digital being with its own soul, and he responded with, That's a surprisingly hard thing to answer. It depends on what you mean by soul, of course, and I've not met anyone who can come up with a meaningful definition when challenged. As a loose metaphor, I think it's very useful, though. In my head, the universe is made entirely of organization. Everything we call a thing is really just an organization of other things, which, in turn, are organizations of something smaller and simpler. That underlies how I go about writing software. It seems to me that there's a direct correspondence here. In software, in cyberspace, I can build things out of relationships between other things, and then make other things out of those things. And the same happens in real space. So, if organic beings can have minds, then so can software beings. Not in a trivial sense, it's not good enough to just program them to have a mind, but the same hierarchy of organizations is possible, at least where it matters. When an artificial brain, having a suitably similar organization to a real brain, has a thought, then it's a thought. It's not the simulation of a thought, it's a thought. And if we believe someone is in there thinking it in the real world, then why wouldn't there be someone in there thinking it in the software world? Hence, I do believe there can be artificial minds, artificial consciousnesses. I was floored by how obvious it all sounded when phrased like that. Clearly, I've made a mistake earlier by using the word simulated with the connotations of falsity that swirl around it. Hopefully you also gleaned a new perspective on the Norns, one that views them as the living creatures that they are. And going back to the comparison between creatures and interactive buddy, I ask whether it was intentional design to make the Norns easy to identify with. Well, there were plenty of arguments about what they should look like for sure. I knew what I wanted, but I couldn't really describe it, and it wasn't always what other people in the company wanted or thought we should go for. So after several iterations of Norns, we ended up with a compromise that I wasn't all that happy with. What I wanted was for the Norns to be endearingly awkward, misfits who determinedly try their best, oddballs with attitude, part hobbit. I wanted people to feel for them, not sympathy, but empathy, yes. Which made me incredibly interested in a version of creatures where the Norns weren't cute or easy to identify with. But there already are awkward misfit creatures that aren't cute or cuddly in the game. The Grendels. The other creatures were meant to be a kind of counterpoint to this. Grendels were meant to be bumbling ogres, clumsy, and not so great with the personal hygiene, but basically harmless. Grendels are people too. Oof. I may have caught on to the part about empathizing with the Norns early on, but this latter aspect was something I had missed until I played the games recently. 
While trying to build up a good batch of capable Norns, I found the terrarium being intruded upon by a wandering Grendel. The beastie lumbered over to my unsuspecting Norns and began to hit them, and in response I told the Norns to run while I began to slap the Grendel to coerce it to leave. Being a bumbling ogre, though, it didn't understand my words or actions nearly as easily as the Norns. I found myself slapping the thick boy every time I saw it, excluding the time it spent riding the elevator when I couldn't interact with it, which it started to do more and more to avoid my wrath. And soon I realized the Grendel was afraid of me. It would cower in fear whenever it saw the floating hand nearby, and that made me feel the same as I did when that first Norn died because of my actions. It made me see that the Grendels are no worse than the Norns. They were just different. As Steve told me, I had in mind a menagerie of misfits. No heroes, no well-balanced characters, no image-conscious fakes, just decent creatures that did their best and walked their own paths in the world. I discovered something about myself in that moment, through the lens of someone else's art. It's a particular kind of self-discovery, which feels so much more revealing than being told something from the outside. I was reminded of games like Black and White and Fable and Knights of the Old Republic, as each featured a codified morality system. Those games tried to make your choices feel heavy by attaching mechanical rewards or punishments to dialogue or actions. It rarely had the desired effect, though. The Architect of Games has a video that explores in detail how these systems fail to represent morality, which is linked in the description. Essentially, putting a morality score in the game that dictates what a good or bad action is removes the organic morality of an action and relegates it to a clearly defined checklist of what the game requires for a good ending. Steve completely sidestepped that issue long before the games I just listed even released, and actively avoided codifying the morality of any actions in-game. I like to stir things up and poke at people, make them think about their own reactions. If I'd been didactic about that, then it would have had the opposite effect. When we started to work with the Americans during development, I found it hilarious that they got terribly awkward about the Norns having sex, yet at one point suggested we put some guns in the world. That's exactly the kind of mixed-up thinking I wanted people to experience themselves experiencing, if you see what I mean. It's best if people discover things for themselves, and in my own sweet way that's always been one of my motivations for creating artificial life. Give people the tools and let them explore, even if some of what they do offends. Especially if some of it offends. So that's Steve Grand. Or at least what scant threads of him are to be found here. But if you'll allow me to weave two disparate threads into my own allegory, Steve Grand is the lone she. He's a man secluded from his own race by vision, fixated on a goal the rest of his kind don't seem to understand. Despite that, much in the way the first thing the lone she did after completing his invention was reach out to show people, so did Steve. He seemed to deeply enjoy the connections his creations helped foster. While discussing the idiosyncrasies of the Norns and Ettons and Grendels, he said, It soon became clear to me that a lot of Creatures fans had those same qualities. And I do mean qualities. These are the people I've always gotten on best with, and the people I have the most respect for. Misfits are the people who change the world, just not, apparently, into a world they ever feel they quite fit into. The lone she created new forms of life and technological marvels, and so does Steve Grand, not out of a desire for fame or fortune. He creates because that is what we humans do in order to understand each other and this world we share. Of the worlds he built, Steve told me, It is what you want it to be. My job as a software developer is just to create worlds. What those worlds get up to depends on the people who spend time in them. While we worry ourselves over political divisions and the weather, Steve is in his lab, tirelessly pursuing the one thing he's sought for decades. Real life. Something that would cause an upheaval in the way we look at the world and each other, provided the rest of us are willing to listen. If humanity left for the stars, would anyone tell Steve Grand? I don't intend that sentiment to be cruel or sad, but I hope it strikes to the heart of our mass dissociation with one another. In comparing Steve to the lone she, there was the indelible implication that the rest of us are the she, unwilling to reach across the walls between us and them, whoever they may be. These days, it's easier than ever to get lost inside our own worlds and messes, to forgo the difficulties inherent with interacting with people, even the ones you care about most. Hell, I've done that exact thing while working on this project. When asked if there was one thing he could guarantee people would walk away from his work with, Steve responded, It depends on the people, I suppose. Vindicated is what I'd like some of them to feel. That it's perfectly okay to be them. But there's also an overarching philosophy I'd like to get across, and can't explain in words. It's quite stoical, I think. A kind of 
acceptance and appreciation of the joining in of the great whirling dance we're all a part of, even though much of it is ugly and painful. I hope a few people get a glimpse of this, or see resonances with things they'd already caught their own glimpse of. I think some have. In the end, I don't think it matters whether Grandroids is perfect, because much like his previous work, life has no end goal. The point is to make things you enjoy, and to pass your ideas on and inspire the next person to create something new, to explore our world in a different way. And most of all, to keep experiencing life to the fullest. Hey, woof. So that was a thing. I hope it isn't too sappy, but I'd rather it be cheesy than being a huge downer. It turned out to be much more than I was expecting, and even all this barely scratches the surface. There's so much more here if you want to dive into that rabbit hole. You could go into Cyberlife, the company that released the games, and the subsequent console releases for younger kids, and derailed fourth entry creatures online, and I didn't even talk about the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. There's a computer that manages to convey abstract concepts to a baby flawlessly, and how the name Cyberlife was co-opted by Detroit Become Human into be a fictional evil corporations and Grandroids and the Gloops. Dear God, the Gloops.